Okay. So, huh? um, just go to the go to the channel on YouTube. Yeah, and just share the link in Discord or something like that. Uh, okay. Hi. Cool. Awesome. Um, sorry for the slight technical delay. Um, so before we get started with the actual um, club meeting, if anybody needs the news link ahead of time, um, there it is. So you can follow along with the stories. But before that, um, Adam has some, I guess, opening announcements from the club president who's not here this week. Yep. Uh, so it just basically, if uh, anyone, just an open for an um, invitation, if anyone wants to do a talk or is, it, is working on an interesting project, or want it, wants to have the pressure to uh, research something, um, you guys are welcome to message us and uh, uh, register for a talk. Um, we can help you with, with setting, with um, putting it together. Um, so yeah. Um, and then also we're still looking for some challenge developers for the CTF. So if you're interested, then uh, come talk to me or message us in the Discord chat and uh, and uh, then we can get you set up on that. And then also um, some more uh, CTF news. Uh, we're, we, have the we have the sponsorship information on the uh, iSessions website. So if you guys uh, know of someone that um, ha is running a company that might be interested in sponsoring the event, um, you guys can please ask. Th we encourage you to ask them, see if they might be interested. Um, and. Yeah, that would be a lot of help. And then also, uh, for, we put together an IS Sessions LinkedIn page and an Instagram account. So if you guys want to add yourself, if you want to follow um, and share, then yeah. That's basically all the announcements. So. Awesome. Uh, so news, because uh, a lot of stuff happened since our last meeting, because that was almost, what, like a month ago? Yeah. Uh, OK. <laughs> So, uh, to start off, um, so I'm trying to break the news into categories these days. So, there's going to be a bunch of like privacy, general info, sex stories, and we're going to group all the cybercrime stuff, and then like patches and updates and volumes, and so on and so on until we run out of stories. Uh, like I said, we have a, like an ass load of news to cover, so we're just going to go through the main, like the short stories really, really quick before the main story that. Adam and mystery guest are gonna host, or is it just you? It's so just me. Okay, cool. Yep. And our um, uh, random code repo rummage exercise that's gonna be my new favorite thing. So, um, first story. <sighs> like, is anybody in here old enough to ha have had a MySpace? Most of you? Some of you? A subset I've heard of, of it. you? Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, so, when people get given autonomy and authority over an information system where people do things like have private messages and post stuff, they tend to abuse it because people are going to people. So I guess MySpace actually had a tool called Overlord that would let employees monitor anything that any of their users were doing. Um, so that's a bit sketch, not great. Not that the site's around anymore, but kind of digging through like the ashes of what's left, they discovered that this was, um, I guess, a regular occurrence that employees would spy on users. Um, so this, it, I mean, it's the equivalent of like, you know, Twitter reading your DMs or Facebook reading private messages or does, so these does tools Instagram exist with other social media sites as well. Like they mentioned Facebook, Snapchat also had like an admin tool where users could see everything. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's MySpace wasn't the only one yeah. to do something like that. Yeah. I mean from an administrator super user debugging purpose, I can get why a tool like this would exist. But the fact that it said up employees, like a few people used it, not cool, not great. Um, yeah, so just keep in mind that that stuff happens. Like any shared service you use, all of your data and your communications are open to, you know, like scrutiny, I guess. Yeah. So a uh, Dutch bank was attacked by a Russian hacking crew, um, allegedly. Um, the, allegedly, the Russian hacking crew, they broke into, they've been breaking into uh, multiple banking networks. Um, they've been using some custom uh, exploits um, the group is perceived to be, or assumed to be very small. Um, the heist that just happened was about, they stole about, allegedly stole about $3 million in uh, Bangladesh. Um, basically the way, the way they um, went, about, went about this was they infiltrated the bank's network, they installed malware, they gained control of the card processing uh, system, and then they would bring in mules and they would call um, 
and then the ATMs would withdraw money, and they disabled uh, any of the alarms uh, that were that would notify admins that uh, money's been large sums of money have been deposited from the ATM. So yeah, neat, very like science fiction stories. Okay, so if you check the date on this one, this article is from four years ago, but this is going to be the background for a story that's about to happen or that just happened. Um, so. Uh, there was, I guess, a popular Twitch streamer named Phantom Lord, and who got kind of harassed by um, sort of like an uh, abusive black hat group, if you want to call them that. Basically, what they would do is fire up um, 4chan's low orbiting ion cannon and try to DOS his Twitch stream while he was streaming. Um, I think someone said another time uh, this user actually got swatted um, by people that didn't like them as well. Um, so that's not great when that kind of stuff happens, and we're used to hearing about that, and then no repercussions. But Four years later, they caught one of the ringleaders of this gang, and this week they were um, sentenced to pay $95,000 in damages to um, one or a series of the victims that they were kind of dossing and making life hell for, which is great. Because um, so many times in this industry and in this sector, we're used to um, bad guys just getting away scot-free because it's a very low-risk uh, business for cyber criminals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the screen or not. Because I didn't realize it's not updated. Um, the. Okay. He also turned. Oh. Well, that's great. Here, I'm just gonna. Um. So hopefully that gets fixed. Yeah. Uh, he mostly targeted uh, like video game com video game companies. So Steam. Um. Uh. What was it? League of Legends. The other two. Hmm. Games like that. So a really awful person. Hmm. Yeah. I'm going to worry about the video. Uh, anyways, uh, so in, right, uh, this data warehouse vendor um, had a whole ton of uh, information and collections and data for uh, large organizations. And like we've seen a number of times recently, a misconfigured Amazon S3 bucket uh, left all the data open and exposed to the internet because people are not great at um, locking down S3 buckets, I guess. Although they're secure by default. Um, yeah. So it means that they went in and and purposely made it more secu Less secure, and secure. Yeah, yeah totally. Uh, yeah. So like lots of there was email backups. There was all kinds of other stuff on there. Uh, that's never good. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and then there was uh, some Mac malware that was being uh, going around. So it was spread uh, by using pop by using websites. So they would uh, create a pop up saying to update Flash, and when users click the. Uh, um, click the button to update Flash. They would uh, drop malware. Um, there was some different behaviors that were that were found, some dropped unwanted apps, some Safari browser extensions. Um, the The way that you got to these phishing sites was, uh, was uh, through Google search results. So some were, so it was quite on quite popular search results. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Like who still that's downloads Flash though? Who does that? Is there automatic updates for Flash though? Who uses Flash? You don't need it for anything. <laughs> like the second YouTube switched over, I never had a reason for it anymore. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, from TechCrunch, um, a bunch of hackers uh, basically broke in and stole loads and loads and loads of text messages and other data from uh, just an open repository that uh, um, some of the telcos had. So that sucks. Um, yeah. It's, it seems like it was they wanted to target certain individuals. Um, and just and go with bulk collection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so it was mostly metadata as well. Yeah. It wasn't uh, recorded phone calls. And mostly Americans, so they don't worry about it. So that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a forensic service provider in the UK, and not like computer forensics like we do, um, actual like blood and guts forensics company that had data on a lot of working police files uh, got hit with ransomware. So uh, that's not great because they kind of need those files to prosecute people. Um, so they got hit with that uh, in early June and they had all their stuff encrypted and then they went ahead and had to pay the ransom to get all that data back um, because maybe they just didn't have offline backups. Um, that's one of those from this week. Uh, Florida City paid 600 grand um, to a different ransomware provider because they locked down the city with that strain of ransomware. Um, a court in Georgia 
um, also got hit, so you kind of can't run trials if you can't get access to the evidence. There's a bit of a, bit of a trend here. Um, apparently, municipalities and larger, or, large organizations are super vulnerable to ransomware, and nobody has offline backups, otherwise they wouldn't have to keep paying the ransom. Yeah. The other lesson from this, though, is sometimes places pay the ransom. Um, it's just cheaper than rebuilding all that data. Like all those forensic tests and the lab hours put into developing DNA evidence and crap like that, they just don't have the time and the resources to redo all that, so they look at paying the ransom as a cost of doing business. Mm -hmm. A really shitty cost of doing business. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I actually don't. Know. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, smart TVs. People are concerned about smart TVs. And Samsung was like, yo, yo, don't worry. We're going to teach you how to virus scan your TV, your smart TV. So they published a video um, <laughs> showing you. First, you got to like lube up the TV. That's really important. Um, is this the video? <laughs> oh, it's not the video. Oh, so there's been a uh, there's been a playlist. I <laughs> 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 mean, on how pros clean TV screens. <laughs> there, how to scan. Sm sm Apparently, I landed on some wacky <laughs> playlist for <laughs> smart TVs. Anyways, um, so there's this like almost three minute video that shows you basically how to treat it like a Windows box and go into it and like configure all these insane options to enable regular malware scanning of your friggin' smart TV. And people just said, this is stupid and ridiculous. I'm not gonna do all this to set up virus scanning on my television. Why do I even need virus scanning on my television? That's dumb, you're dumb. And then <laughs> actually shortly after Samsung pulled down the tweet linking to the video, they still have a message out there that says like, hey, you should be concerned with the you know, data on your smart TV and that it's vulnerable to attack, but they didn't link directly to the video anymore. So, I mean, I guess that's good. Um, you can watch this in its entirety if you want. It's absolutely insane. The number of like menus and clicks and options though. At um, least they try. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's as far as we'll go with that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like the article says at the top, it's, this isn't a security article. It's just, it was a rough month for the internet um, in terms of like things like BGP hijacks and massive outages affecting stuff like Cloudflare and some of the other large cloud service providers. You may have noticed that throughout the sort of month, a bunch of services were down. Like Twitter was down for almost like an hour yesterday and I actually lost my mind. <laughs> I got so much done though, it was awesome. Uh, but uh, yeah, these, these just problems. Maybe it suggests something about why is it a good idea that we use Cloudflare as the CDN for everything. Like why are we writing and storing all our content with one cloud service provider. That's not great because yep. it introduces single points of failure and we're all about availab availability and integrity in our industry. Yep. And Cloudflare got hit twice with two different incidents, right? One with Verizon and one with an internal uh, oh, uh, should have heard that. update. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so there was that where they had to roll back. Um, I just found it hilarious how uh, Facebook had to send a tweet using Twitter to say, letting people know that Facebook was down. Yeah. I found that funny. Yeah. Couldn't go on Twitter and rage about Twitter being <laughs> down. Yeah. Um, so uh, the cool thing, though, about a lot of these large orgs like Cloudflare and Twitter, they often go into extreme detail when publishing um, information about why the outages happened. And it's a cool way to learn about massive um, backend infrastructure that otherwise we would never have the ability um, to see unless you work there. So sometimes their write-ups are really uh, worth reading as sort of um, after after incident reports. They're really cool. Um, that's where, <clears throat> where I learned that Facebook makes their own switches, like network switches. They custom designed and built switches that handle their traffic specifically because they have like a 10 page blog article on how they track down some wacky hardware vulnerability in their custom switches. Neat, right? Oh. So this stuff's worth reading, just not right now. Um, oh man, so the London Met, which is the London Metropolitan Police, um, have implemented facial recognition technology. And we're not gonna go too into this because this is your, um, part of your big, like not yep. this one specifically, but yep. part of the big story for the evening. Um, and they found that like 81% of the time it flagged the person's face as the wrong person. 
So awesome. We're doing really good with accuracy and you know error margin of error on facial recognition technology. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably good that you know you can't really charge somebody just based on a facial scan yet because that's rough. Like that, that's like what four fifths of the time it's wrong. So like the one fifth that just accidentally got the person right, I guess. Mm -hmm. That yeah. wouldn't play out too well in court. No, definitely not. So. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, um, a security researcher published a video of a bypass or a vulnerability or an exploit, I forget which one, that they had found and they posted it to their YouTube channel. YouTube took it down because it was hacking. Um, and then everybody in the infosec industry was like, what the hell? Um, because there are like years worth of conference video uploaded to YouTube that's literally describing like, you know, bypass vulnerability exploitation techniques. Um, so they said, you can't do this, and eventually YouTube rolled it back and said, uh, yeah, actually, that never should have gotten banned in the first place. It was just an accident with our, um, our banning software. So I guess you really can YouTube everything. You can YouTube how to hack YouTube. Yeah, you probably could. There you go. Yeah. Um, so just, just something to watch out for, something to be concerned with when it comes to automated content monitoring as well. Sometimes it will you know, trigger false positives, and it thought that this was some malicious hacking video, but really it was just some researcher's content. Yep, and then D-Link. So D-Link stuff was um, sued. Yeah, it was it was brought to court by the uh, Federal Trade Commission for um, false advertising. So they advertised their security products as advanced security, but didn't validate their advanced security features. And uh, D-Link has had a bit of a track record when it came to vulnerabilities, such as include such as including but not limited to non-removable default passwords and IP cameras command injection flaws, leaked router security keys, plain text passwords uh, stored in the mobile app, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, not so much advanced security, um, but it has a good uh, ending because instead of um, them paying a big fine, they uh, settled by saying that they're gonna implement a security program and actually validate their tools. So yeah, I think that's a good turnout. Yeah, totally. I mean, for the next 20 years, that's, that's intense. Like you're gonna have your entire staff roll over in 20 years, gonna have new people there. Um, but cool, if they can actually make a program like that work, that's cool. What happens after 20 years? They just get all lax with their security again? <laughs> I don't know. Um, but interesting. Uh, yeah. There'll be another shuffle with uh, D-Lake. <laughs> yeah, we'll get in trouble again. Uh, nothing with this one's 20 years. Uh, yes, so basically just there's a lot of uh, CVs that were fixed. So 33 CVs were fixed and nine were critical. Um, and so basically Google pushed this out and I believe this is going to be to their Pixel lineup um, but it's also available to uh, for uh, Android vendors whether they will or will not push it out is another thing is another um, question but yeah that pretty much is it it's a bit sketch 13 entries are for closed source products where Qualcomm does not provide specific information on the nature of the flaw or the exact component so that means there's probably more vulnerabilities in there that they just haven't found yet good awesome <laughs> Um, was this one? This is probably one of mine. This one it was yours, yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, so the Akamai blog, Akamai is another content distribution network and sort of DDoS prevention provider. Um, they had this blog entry on a, a botnet sort of worm that's going around and actually breaking IoT devices, uh, essentially breaking their ability to get on the internet. Um, that makes for a really shitty botnet, but it in a way kind of saves the IoT devices from being used in other people's botnets. So that's interesting. Um, the entry mechanism, default login creds, awesome. Security is not actually hard. Pen testing is not actually hard. You just scan the internet for default creds and now you have like a thousand machines doing your bidding. Yep. And that's kind of how this works. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of it. That's the detail. They go into a little bit of info on how it actually breaks the, uh, um, like breaks the box so it doesn't, um, you know, uh, boot anymore, but yeah, okay. A uh, smart home hub, um, so another IoT device, uh, can be hacked to basically remotely open and unlock the door. Um, this is like the bajillionth one of these that we've covered. The nice thing is that this one I don't think is necessarily over Bluetooth, it's just remote Wi Fi um, problems that you can crack it with. So good, awesome. Um, IoT stuff's terrible. Hopefully getting better. So there was. Yeah, so basically uh, there was some research that went through and they identified about 100 uh, vulnerable apps. 
though and um, the apps used a variety of techniques usually they would pull content uh, they would pull the malicious ads from um, from websites so they wouldn't load them in in the app so when Google scanned them they wouldn't it wouldn't find uh, these malicious practices um, and it's just another like another list of, uh, another batch of uh, applications that has been found because another researcher previously another research firm found like similar like a similar dump so yeah they all seem to be using kind of the same code so yeah cool. so good job Google for trying to clean up the Play Store I mean a hundred apps out of a bajillion is like a drop in the pond but whatever they're still trying that's great um, I only have two articles left this month with Wired, apparently. That's cool. Um, oh, okay, so MongoDB, which is an object style NoSQL database that we've mentioned a number of times because people have a, a habit of leaving this particular database client exposed to the internet. Um, so the person in charge of MongoDB's sort of privacy and security initiatives, uh, a person named Davi Ottenheimer, um, said, like, data breaches are stupid, let's try to do something about it in the core functionality of our database. So they went ahead and they implemented a feature that has existed in Oracle for a long time, but they made it way better. They created this feature called field level encryption, where if I pull up like a record or a table of data, right, there are some fields and some values in there that based on who I am, which account I'm using, I shouldn't be able to see. So it will leave those particular values either undisplayed or encrypted so that I can't see them. The neat part and what's innovative about their new approach is that the decryption key that my account uses to decrypt the data actually resides on my local system. That means if a bad guy compromises somebody's account and starts to try to siphon data out of this database across the internet, even if it, the data lands on their system, they don't have my local copy of my account's decryption key, so they couldn't see the data even if they actually accessed it and pulled it all down through some kind of SQL injection or other web application exploit. That's a great technique. Um, I don't know enough yet, because I haven't read too much of, of it, about like sort of how the key management works and what the key storage is like and how you recover your key and all that kind of stuff, but that's a really cool approach to it, the fact that the data is still encrypted as it goes over the wire, and it's even still encrypted when it hits my browser, it's only unencrypted or decrypted by my local copy yeah. of the app. Super cool idea. And the nice thing about it is they're also, uh, they're asking cryptographers to take a look at this beforehand, so they're asking for open, um, open comment, um, and they've already started implementing apparently some recommendations nice. uh, from, from uh, one university, so yeah. Really cool. Say. Excellent. They're taking that approach, which is nice to see. It is, because data breaches are a great big problem. Um, and crypto is a tough problem, too. Always. Uh, so we haven't made fun of WordPress in a while, like at <laughs> least two whole meetings. Um, and actually, again, this time it's not WordPress's fault. It was um, third-party plugins developed by Facebook um, that were shown to be vulnerable. That's all. <laughs> we're not going to go into detail. It's just fun to poke fun at Facebook or WordPress plugins. That's all. <laughs> um, so always, always, always audit and update your plugins. If you do run a WordPress blog, like there's literally a checkbox that says automatically update my blog. You don't have to do anything. Just, just do that. Mm -hmm. um, John Deere um, that make tractors. Um, they also had a, apparently USBs. Yeah, they had a marketing <laughs> giveaway at one of their events, and which, what the dumb thing about the Vice article is that it doesn't have a picture of the thing. Doesn't I thought it did. It did. Huh? Did it? Did I think it did. Uh, yeah, but I don't want to show the video. I just want to show a still picture. Okay. Uh, John Deere USB. You just got it. What face image? Yeah. So basically, what happened was. <laughs> so basically, what happened is when you, whenever users plugged in the USB, it would uh, the USB would be identified as a keyboard, and then it would launch. A key, depending on the operating system, it would launch the web browser and direct it to John Deere's website. Yeah. Um, okay. And people didn't like that no. for so obvious reasons. I saw a Google image. Um, this thing. That's what it is. Yeah. So basically, it's a little USB tab. It's not even a USB stick. It's got no, it's got no real storage on it. It's got like enough bytes to tell your computer to just simulate the keystrokes of opening a web browser and typing in a URL. You can't actually use this thing as storage. Think of it as like an embedded program on a little chip that they plug in. Um, yeah, if it sounds sketchy, it is. 
<laughs> I like how the screen shook. Um, <laughs> because in the infosec industry, hardware vendors sell these as like instant physical exploitation tools. They call them like USB rubber duckies, and they go by a bunch of other names. Where basically it's a series of pre-programmed keystrokes on a USB stick that tells the computer it's actually a keyboard when it's plugged in. Um, just John Deere was like, no, no, we don't want to do that. We just want to like essentially like trick somebody's computer into opening our website. Yeah. Um, it's also a little bracelet though. I don't know if you noticed that. Like it plugs into the other end, so you could like wear it around as a hot fashion item before you open their website. That's actually a cool idea. Right. Nice. So, I thought it was a lanyard based on the picture that I saw. We should totally order some and reprogram them. To but that open, means we have to plug them in somewhere. To open the IS Sessions website. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Maybe um, it might be regarding to tracking because the malicious uh, I intent would be like once you plug it in, they could identify where you are. Yeah. So, yeah. Whether you actually went to a trade show and are a farmer or just kind of like looking at tractors. So, I don't know why this link didn't work. Um, there's supposed to be another slash there. Okay, uh, that's weird because this was working this morning. Um, what if I just Google that? The Avast Cybercrime. I didn't see that one. Okay. Uh, well, if it doesn't load. Nice. Okay, well, this URL that's not loading right now, but maybe will in a little bit. Um, it's actually really cool. It basically it pops up a web app, and there's just two text boxes that you got to fill out. The first one is how many people are at your company, and the second one is how many um, basically like internet connected devices do you have at your company. And you hit calculate, and it comes up with some price figure that represents essentially um, how much per employee you should be spending, um, and what the potential impact is uh, to your org if. Um, you get breached and likelihood and stuff like that. Basically does a bunch of automated risk assessment and risk analysis and turns out um, financial figures essentially based on how many IT devices you got and how many employees you got. Um, if you need like quick and dirty numbers on something, it's probably not a bad resource if the page loads. Um, but uh, there's better tools out there. I just, someone linked it, that was kind of cool. Uh, oh yeah, yes, I've read that, thank you. Um, a, from Europol, which I guess is connected to um, Interpol, uh, a whole bunch of uh, police organizations um, and police departments from different countries around the world got together and set their um, forensics people on trying to come up with a generic decryptor for the Grand Crab strain of ransomware. They have released a tool that will uh, decrypt versions one through four of the Grand Crab ransomware. It's always great when companies release these decryptors because, again, that way people don't necessarily have to pay the ransom if they were infected by um, one of the listed versions of this ransomware. So if you happen to be doing any kind of incident response um, for a ransomware incident, before people even consider paying the ransom, Google around, see if you can figure out the version of the ransomware that you have because there may be a public decryptor for it. Because um, sometimes bad guys screw up and they see these with bad numbers or they use weak keys and stuff like stuff like that. So you can actually um, decrypt the encrypted ransomed data, which is cool. So make that like step one. So I guess we're finding ways to rem re uh, remediate. Yeah. Uh, re remediate. Remediate. Yes, English is hard sometimes. It is. It is. <laughs> um, so uh, reading list if you want to get into threat intel. Um, basically, it's just a, a link to a bunch of um, blogs and articles um, that talk about the kinds of things you would want to like learn and know about if you are going to be looking at threat intelligence data and trying to figure out how to implement that um, at the organization that you work at. Um, things like uh, histories, um, attribution concerns, the MITRE attack framework, um, different resources, stuff like that. So this one's more there as like a resource for you folks if you want to go and read these articles. It's kind of cool. Uh, also neat, security guide for what we would call high value targets in the industry or high net worth individuals. Um, basically a checklist of things um, that they need to go through to safeguard themselves on their own lives. There's no reason this stuff has to apply to just rich folk or important people though. Everybody can take this list and sort of implement these protections themselves. Um, yeah. Um, so just T-Mobile in there? Yeah, because there's um, certain services um, that they 
you know, to use for um, identity theft monitoring and stuff like that. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so it's kind of cool. It's a neat little guide to go through. Basically, it goes through all the advice that we give people on a regular basis anyways. It boils down to like unique passwords per account, using password managers, using two-factor, um, all the yeah. stuff that we tell people to do to avoid uh, identity theft in the first place. Um, it's just kind of been distilled into a really nice, concise list in this quick guide, though. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. Nice. Yeah. Um, I okay, fine. Um, <laughs> because we always pick on some countries, um, it's true that the West, as in probably the NSA, um, hacks other countries as well. We always talk about American co companies getting hacked by either Russian or Chinese um, entities, but uh, this time Reuters is out with an article saying, hey, Western stuff hacked um, Russia's index to spy on accounts, I guess to collect information. Um, so this stuff happens back and forth, like all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so just keep in mind that yeah, it happens everywhere. Mm. Yes, okay, I read this one. So um, the US military launched a cyber attack on Iranian's weapon, weapon system. So basically what happened was Iran shot down a US surveillance drone that, um, that was flying in, over international waters. Um, and so the drone was a, a Global Hawk. It was the world's lar largest surveillance drone, about $130 million. Um, and they use a surface air to, to, and they use a surface uh, to air missile, and so in retaliation to that, the U.S. Um, launched a cyber attack to disable the um, computer systems that control rockets and missile launchers. Um, so yeah, it was an interesting. Actually, uh, we discussed last last IS sessions whether cyber could be used as an offensive. So that uh, so this would be or as an aggressive. Uh, move so this is more of like um, uh, like a retaliation as well so yeah it's interesting to see kind of exciting in a bad way yeah yeah um, right uh, so a 2017 um, vulnerability in Microsoft Outlook uh, is being uh, sort of abused by what they believe is an Iranian hacking group um, basically sending you uh, messages to Outlook that will kind of force open a browser window that then automatically downloads malware to try to compromise your computer. It's kind of like a multi-chained exploit, pro um, exploit chain, if you want to call it that. Um, yep, just that it's happening, it's going on, there's CVE, de CVE yep. details there, um, that's all. Probably targeting businesses because businesses run off of, out off of Outlook. Probably. So, yeah. I guess we're in the nation state part of the news. Um, <laughs> yep. Yeah, this one was wild. You found this. I didn't even hear about this one. This is cool. Yes, actually. So um, basically, the U.S. is doing one, two steps forward, one step back. So um, instead of creating, instead of adding, putting everything on the internet, they said, "Let's go back to analog because people can't hack that." Um, so they're what they're <coughs> proposing is for critical infrastructure, so such as electricity um, generation, to switch back to analog tools, um, so that um, they can't be hacked um, without uh, they they can't be yeah they can't be hacked so it reduces risks um, and yeah so and I think they much it. it's an analog even some manual controls too yeah um, they like want replacing add. some stuff that's computer controlled to be, be go back to being mm -hmm. person controlled yeah. um it's kind of a neat stopgap kind of neat idea yeah. um the ongoing crypto wars so every now and then. Um, Usually the American government uh, administration decides that they don't like encryption because obviously bad guys are going to encrypt all the things and then they can't read what bad guys are doing. Um, and then usually though, like it doesn't take long for those arguments to get shot down by people saying, yeah, but if you backdoor all the crypto or you force weak crypto, that causes way more harm than you just not being able to read a few bad guy messages. Um, I swear everyone is going to see this argument coming up again and again and again throughout their career because it does. And luckily, it keeps getting shot down, all the, except in Australia, where they passed that legislation um, that actually did end up weakening some crypto. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Not so good. Because um, the NSA kept screwing up when they were collecting phone data, and a lot of it was useless, and they found out that this program, uh, the metadata collection program, was kind of stupid, and it really didn't help them all that much, they just said, screw it, we're going to stop doing it. So that's cool. Um, anytime they stop collecting one form of data, it's kind of nice. They'll switch to another for sure. Mm. You just don't know what it is. Yeah. Well, they're just, they have everybody's Alexa tap now. But <laughs> yeah. Yep. So that was cool. There's uh, just a different article on it from the EFF 
uh, talking about how they're ending the call records, mm -hmm. uh, ending the yeah. call records program. Cool. Uh, so China has been uh, install apparently installing uh, malware on people's phones that when they've been crossing the border. Uh, it isn't in China's uh, border. It's uh, within one of their provinces, one of their administration zones, I believe. Um, and so, yeah. So whenever you when you when tourists or re um, when tourists cross, uh, tourists yeah, tourists cross. They uh, they were told to hand their phones over so they could install malware on it, um, so that or they could install spyware on it, so they could uh, check. Uh, so they could uh, see text messages, call records, uh, your calendar, and look for banned documents. Um, so yeah, it's not the first time that um, the government has, has pushed spyware, but it is uh, the first reported time that uh, tourists have been targeted. So, um, Motherboard's also hosting the actual piece of malware um, on their GitHub page, so you can go there and grab it and do some analysis if you want to. Uh, one of the neat things, it says the malware also scans the phone for over 73,000 files, likely by hash value. Um, I didn't look yet at anybody kind of trying to see what those hash values were. It could just be for um, files and material that's um, contraband or banned in China or stuff that would suggest um, stuff they don't like. I'm not sure. Um, but so basically add yeah. a space to all your documents. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, one space. And you may defeat it. Yeah. Um, so it's cool that it's there. So you can go do some analysis uh, or just install it on your phone if you just want to let them know what you're up to. That's cool. Yep. I, I mean, you do you. Sharing is caring. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, same thing, just a different write-up on it because we found two articles on it. Yeah. Uh, oh, this was cool. Um, and it's like actually legit spy versus spy kind of stuff. So um, I believe it was like an oil platform or an oil rig somewhere that they think Iran, um, like Iranian hackers were in control of, um, got targeted by a Russian hacking group and they just kind of kicked the others off of it and then they took it over. So it's like hacker king of the hill um, on this like system which is kind of neat, um, knowing that stuff like that is like actually, actually actively happening out there in the world of weirdo spy versus spy kind of stuff. That, crazy. Um, the article comments, though, it's going to make attribution really, really hard if a system is regularly being like re-owned by different countries and compromised, because you're not really sure who's in control of it when it attacks you. Um, yeah, attribution's hard anyway, so whatever. Almost done. Last one. Um, somebody just pull up a bunch of resumes and CVs or curriculum vitae, vitae for employees at Huawei, that uh, uh, telecom manufacturer, uh, telecom equipment manufacturer in China, and found out that a bunch of them just on their resumes have links to Chinese intelligence services. Um, that's some like sick social engineering right there. Um, so it casts even further doubt on the legitimacy of the hardware that this company is providing if a lot of their employees are directly linked to a nation's intelligence service. However, later in the week after that story got published, there was a bunch of backlash because in the US, like probably like 40% of the InfoSec people you will meet are ex-US military service people. Um, and they all freely admit it. It's all in all their resumes. So can you say that they're necessarily spying at the companies they work for? Or did they like just get their training in the army because it was free and good? And when they finished their tour of duty, they went and got a job. Um, it's entirely possible that it could be the same for this company, but also maybe not. Um, yeah, it's hard to jump to those kinds of conclusions, but just keep stuff like that in mind. I don't to those things. Huh. That was the end of our like super long rapid fire news section. Now it's next uh, get repo? Yeah, random repo oh, rundown. Right. Okay. Cool. Um, so I'm going to do this. Um, this is the second iteration of this random sequence or random section that I wanted to do where I just look, go through all my starred blog entries in GitHub because I've got like hundreds of random open source projects starred that I always want to go back and take a look at, but I never have time to. So this is my excuse to do it. Um, so yeah, this is round two. This time I tried putting the stuff in slides rather than you watching me just scroll through GitHub because that wasn't as exciting. So the tool I picked this time is called Dumpster Fire, which is awesome. Um, its tagline from the developer is security incidents in a box. And the whole idea is that you essentially configure a dumpster fire and you hit go. And what it does is simulate a bunch of bad guy activity on your network. 
which is awesome because I always struggle to find good collections of like malicious network traffic to use for examples and stuff in class. Here is the link to the repo. Um, it's try catch HCF, so try catch Halt and catch fire um, slash dumpster fire. Um, from the readme.md file, um, basically just the description essentially boils down to it's like a command line menu driven utility that lets you configure a set of fires and bundle all of these little fire objects into what they call a dumpster fire. Then you can configure things like start and stop times and different payloads and, and modules um, for your dumpster fire and then you can go trigger it on one or a number of hosts to then simulate and test out how your blue team or defensive team responds, or even if like a red team wants to use it to simulate what, or see what kinds of traffic they would be generating if they did certain events on a network and stuff like that. Um, they wrote it to be very extensible. You can create your own modules. It basically boils down to writing a class in Python that has a function called ignite. And basically this thing will call you the ignite method uh, on your class if you've added that as a fire to the overall dumpster fire job. Um, the dev is Joe Gervais. Um, yeah. uh, the project organization, so the main program or file that you want is called dumpsterfirefactory.py. It is a dumpster fire factory. It creates dumpster fires. Um, and literally to run it, it's just dot slash dumpster fire factory. And it launches you into this, um, I thought I had a picture of the GUI on here. Um, I don't, one sec. I'll just show you, kind of give you an idea of what the GUI looks like from the MD file. Um, it's very like cutesy, menu driven. You just kind of like, you can save dumpster fires, you can load them, you can add fires to them, you can configure them. It's all just numerically um, generated menus from the command line with cute ASCII fire art. So I love the whole attitude of this program, it's amazing. Um, other stuff, so if you want to write modules, there's fire modules and dumpster fires. Um, so fire modules are where you write modules and you throw them in there. So these things will control what your dumpster fire does. Does it um, try to install Mimi cats? Does it just start Googling for words like hacking tools? Um, all the kind of behavior you want to simulate ends up in this folder. Um, dumpster fires is where your saved, configured, um, executable campaigns get saved. Um, Ignite dumpster fire is sort of like a headless script if you want to run this thing um, in an automated way. It just enables you to do that. Um, there's a module test script and then there's just an init file to make the whole thing into a package. Um, it runs on old Python, which is not great because that um, Python 2.7 and, and older is being deprecated in favor of Python 3. Um, probably wouldn't take too much to update this thing and probably a good idea. Like I said, to run it, all you got to do is download it, um, download the repo, have Python installed and then run dot slash dumpster fire factory. Um, some stats on the project, hasn't been updated in a couple of years, um, but it's pretty simple, so it's not like it needs to be. Um, you probably, somebody probably could take it on themselves to go and update this thing though to Python 3, that would be cool. Um, the developer also did a talk at a um, security conference about the tool and how it's used and stuff like that, so it's kind of cool. Um, MIT software license, if that matters to you. Um, the actual main run script does a whole bunch of standard library imports and, and the ignite dumpster fire file. There's essentially two main classes. Um, you can either have a fire or you can have a dumpster fire. A dumpster fire is a collection of fires. Um, fires are just um, basically start and stop times for certain modules and a dumpster fire is the collection of those fires with a bit more um, triggering dates and times and stuff like that. It's a really simplistic architecture. It's just here's a list of things I want to do, here's the times I want them to happen. Um, it essentially just walks through the two directories of fires and modules and loads up all that stuff and that's how it draws the GUI menu for you. The main file here is actually mostly just calling the GUI text-based drawing routines and that's kind of boring so it'll have it all in here. Um, these are all the functions in the main um, uh, dumpster fire factory Python file. Uh, again, it's mostly about like creating, configuring, saving, a bunch of objects in Python. The, the core functionality is really simplistic. Um, there's not much to all this if you actually dug into the files. What's amazing about this project is this. For every single function, the developer wrote this sick like pseudocode version of the function so you don't even have to read the function to understand or read the code to know what it's doing. He put it all in here in like plain English. Like for each fire, parse each fire, 
name into fire module path and file name. Convert that thing into a Python package. Like it's, it's such clear English descriptions of what the code is doing. I don't even know why you'd ever need to look at the code. And he did this for all of these functions. It is like the most readable code I have ever found in my life. And it's awesome. And they're all like, you know, like nice ASCII barrier or whatever inside the file. So they're easy to find. It's really cool. Um, like I said, a dumpster fire is just a collection of fires and some scheduling info. Um, a fire is really a pointer to a module um, that's set to start at a certain date and time. Starting a dumpster fire basically iterates over your fire nodes and calls each fire's ignite function. That's it. So to make a new fire yourself, you would just create a Python file with a function called ignite. And in the ignite function, you just have it do whatever you want to do. Do you want to like run a Google query? Do you want to like, I don't know, run an nmap scan on a network? That's it. That's how easy it is to create fires. Um, yeah. There's a couple of fires that have custom behavior. And the way the author gets around that is it just, when you're configuring a fire, it just asks you on the command line, like, hey, you're running the download custom URL fire. What URL do you want? And you just paste it in. Um, here's an example of one of the fire modules, just to give you an idea of how they're structured. Um, this one, uh, so this one's called uh, hackingsites.py in the web surfing or fire modules slash web surfing um, package. This thing basically, um, it does a, a bunch of get requests for known cybersecurity websites like ExploitDB, um, Cyclists, full disclosure to look for um, vulnerabilities and just like a showdown search for the word password on, uh, yeah, default and password on certain devices. So basically all this thing does when you call Ignite, it just runs a bunch of standard get requests over the internet um, to gen essentially with the, the point of generating the traffic for your blue team to investigate. That's all this thing does. It's like a traffic and behavior generator for simulations, which is really cool. It's a really simple, um, a neat project and that's it. Um, that's all that I wanted to come with. Uh, is that uh, combined with the attack framework at all? Uh, I don't believe, at least the, uh, I don't think that the description mentioned if it was modeled on that at all. Uh, we can check. Uh, no, they don't mention the MITRE attack framework at all, but again, um, since it's so straightforward, it probably wouldn't be very difficult to create yourself a new dumpster fire that has that. There's even a couple of pre-configured campaigns in here um, like wayward employee um, and it basically has the employee doing a bunch of sketch stuff um, so which is kind of cool so, yeah. um, neat little repo I don't know want to check it out convert it to Python 3 for the author um, they haven't been up to a lot on github in a while oh uh, yeah that's all uh, so yep uh, well I mean now it's just the main discussion and then our guest speaker so yeah. I was going to make a joke about uh, being on time because Loa is not here, but um, I guess I can't make that joke anymore because we're going to be late either way. Okay, so um, for this topic, uh, basically there was an article, or there's two articles about Wired. One's a bit older, but don't worry about it. So basically the plan is to roll out facial recognition, uh, biometric uh, identification, uh, using facial recognition at airports. So instead of having to show your passport, you just scan your face and it will verify who you are. Um, and so the plan is over the next three years, there'll be a rollout to about 70% of US airports. That's the plan. Um, the vision is that if you walk into an airport, the cameras will pick up who you are and you'll be able to identify, uh, they'll be able to identify you. So um, yeah. Um, one of the main reasons that this technology is being released in the U.S. is because the facial re the facial uh, database um, it has already been created by the U.S. Customs uh, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, and the way that this works is the U.S. Customs and Protection has a database, and they allow airports to connect uh, to query that database. Um, the um, the airport so. Um, yeah, the airlines don't have access to the data. They can only push data to it. So they'll send a picture and be like, hey, is this a user? And they'll be like, either yes or no. And then that's how it authenticates. So um, they're not gonna be storing um, it on, storing that information on, 
on their servers. Do, 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 do. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of the gist of it. So more of it being as the government's going to be the identity provider. Um, so yeah, um, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Any thoughts so far? No. Okay. So the way I thought of this was um, who has uh, just an op just a quick summary. Who has a Google or a Facebook account? I know I do. Yeah, pretty much everyone. How about who has used a single sign-on with Google or Facebook? Yeah, because it's convenient, right? It's convenient and like you don't have to remember another password, right? So what about taking this a step further, this idea, and uh, using the government? So instead of having to create like a social media account, you, you just use your government ID to log into websites. Any, uh, so yeah, what do you guys think of that? Some security concerns? Would you guys want that? No. What about for what about the like uh, certain services, like uh, for example, walking through pa through the border? No. Okay. Okay. Oh, I also government know. services within my own country. I would be cool. Yeah. 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 Okay. Because, but why? Why would you be? Because they know all that stuff already, anyways. So in that case, I think it really would be a continuous effort. Yeah. Do you think that it would they would want to go further and collect more information from you, or? Yeah. Yeah. That's what they do. Okay. Yeah, but probably not third parties. Yeah, because India has created a biometric database as well, and they're adding. Um, they're trying to get people to use it and populate it. So, yeah. Um, so we covered that. Um, another question from this is, if this is using airports to cross the border, um, who's responsible with protecting your data? Would it be the country that you visit? So every time you cross the border, um, they get a copy of your face? Um, like, would you want, if I'm a Canadian citizen, would I want Canada to protect? my information or um, like some kind of treaties. So before yeah. I answer this question, are you, are you saying that other countries are going to be able to access this, this database? Well, they would have to because if if you want to cross the border, so let's say if, you're, if I'm a Canadian citizen and I want to cross to the US border, the, uh, cross to the US, the US would need to know who I am as well, right? Mm -hmm. That's my point. Like, like you still have the passport and your other paper documents. But what if they? What if we move away from passports and just use facial recognition to cross the border? So would you guys want? Would you guys see something like that happening, where if I, as a Canadian citizen, am able to cross the U.S. border with just using face, and then like the, my data is sent over to the U.S. What is your Because if it takes a photo of your face and says, like, with reasonable confidence, it has a perceptual hash that you are the same person in a certain database, there's no photo stored. If, if they want to say that I'm like a 64 character value and track that in a central database, I'm not entirely up in arms about that. Yeah? Okay. Um, but what if, for example, um, okay. But what if, for example, like instead they get they get access to your photo, for example? And you're taking a bus? Have you gone in a mall? I mean, yeah. if you walked into the airport, they already have recorded video of you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make a difference. Yeah. Whether but or not they process it. Right. But there's a certain level of, um, um, like, like there's a failure rate as well with that, right? And people don't really think of it as much, whereas this would be more in your face. And you have to get up and close with the camera and get a good, and make and they make sure that they get a good picture of your face, right? So, yeah, I mean that's um, another thing is like how it, what I'm thinking, what I'm interested in, how they would 
connect? Like, would this be like more political as well? Like, if for example, um, the U.S. and China they want to merge, like, have U- U.S.s like uh, have cross travel, like how they would be able to connect their systems, or like um, um, each country might develop their own kind of method of doing this. So, like, how to bring it all together, like having a central authority, um, like the UN maybe having like a standard. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Let's go ahead. So while I'll say that, although I already know that our government is has been moving to online services and has plans to possibly include AI in the future, as well as many other uh, organizations uh, like Canada, I do feel like the responsibility for just protecting one's identity would rely solely on the government, which is just the main uh, caretaker of that data, and us as Responsibility over how that information, I guess, would be distributed depending on where you go. Right. So it would be a per citizen base. So go ahead. So I don't want to say per citizen base just because it seems more of a this is a societal change that biometrics would propose and is currently being rolled out in airports today, at least for years. Okay. Like yeah. Mm-hmm. So Nick, would you want to add something? Yeah, um, if you're suggesting that it's the governments that are managing this official recognition database, it might actually be better than what we have right now. Because if anybody's booked a flight to the US recently, it's through Air Canada's website that I have to give US Customs and Border Patrol my name, my birthday, my passport number, where I'm going to stay, what I'm going to be doing in the US. And that's all through Air Canada's website. Mm-hmm. If all this is going to be managed through some you know, country, single country control system, it might actually be good because we're taking more third parties out of the equation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, or next. Yeah, how far prices do this work? I mean, if, yeah, they, if Canada's going to do this, they're totally paying some subcontractor to do this. Because they're going to yeah. lose all our stuff. Mm-hmm. And then they're just going to get paid. <laughs> but if it's the government, maybe we can push them to be more accountable. Like it, with Facebook single sign on, like we don't, Facebook's not accountable to us, right? So, where is it? That's true. But I mean, they, there are companies that are getting fined for it, right? And uh, when GDR, G, GDPR was being released, like not, not all companies were prepared for it. Um, so. Yeah, whether they're, but the government has more of an incentive, I would say, to protect that information because it's a lot of paperwork for them. Uh, so, yeah, it's interesting to see where the uh, where the data will will go. I mean, they're they they have the data there. Um, another thing is um, like um, the facial recognition software. Um, another thing is in, like the random spot checks. Maybe it might be. Um, like less, um, uh, what's the word for it? Uh, like the random spot checks. Less discriminatory. Yeah, less discriminatory. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So maybe kind of fine tuning that. Go ahead, John. Too far from the screen, and so says like, uh, wouldn't the security agent agency be responsible for protecting your identity rather than the government? Okay. When it com- if the government does get into this, um, we can't. It's hard to kind of switch, right? Yeah. If like we don't like the way a certain government is implementing this, or they keep uh, messing up, like it's very hard to like go get a citizenship somewhere else. And it's not necessarily um, uh, you're not necessarily sure if they're doing it better. 
and if everything everyone integrates with with themselves so all the countries decide to consolidate and share this data with each other if one gets compromised um, then and one of them probably will um, how, what's the effects on everyone else right like they can once they have access to that database even just to start um, querying it right just sending pictures and be like who is this person and they're returning a name like that has huge concerns so yeah and this information that, that they're putting in here is required so if you want a passport you have to post your picture so it's hard to opt out of it too right and they're just taking that data um, so yeah hopefully if it means I can walk to the airport faster though I'm probably gonna do it like I was super against using this button on the back of my phone for my fingerprint until I realized how fast I could log into my phone <laughs> That's really true. So That's really true. Yeah. It's really nice. Right? Yeah. So I mean eventually we're just gonna be through it anyways. Um because if you've never, you know, had to deal with like rough airport experiences, um being able to just like walk through mm -hmm. and not have to do would kind of be awesome. Yeah. I mean uh so it is true that um it is gonna be faster, it takes about half the time to process it. But you still have to go through the manual um, security check where they pat you down and they uh, x-ray your um, stuff. So that's still not automated yet, which I think that's the more annoying part than just showing your passport to someone. But so this like, solves the border line, that's it? Yep, that's it. <laughs> and we're throwing millions of dollars at it. It's more of we're solving one aspect of the border crossing that yeah. doesn't address the whole problem, which yeah. is getting the scanning part, which is yeah. why it was it doesn't really save much time when you implement it. It's just a feature that will help for uh, for the Canadian border, the CBSA. Thank you. The CBSA to administer their cross yeah. procedures or whatever. I can't think of a time I spent more than like 15 minutes. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Usually those lineups are really long, though. Depends on the time you're flying. Yeah, that's true. Well, even in the middle of the night, they usually stacks up. So. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah, and the conversation is not always pleasant. So, yeah. In any case, all right. So now, uh, please welcome uh, Adam Greenhill. That will talk about CSV injection. Do you guys have like Wi-Fi or anything? Internet? Yeah. We have Wi-Fi. You went here. It's not the storage just yet. <laughs> yeah, so my credentials expired like maybe like a year ago, yeah. and I should have okay. updated that. Yeah, hmm? just keep using the same yeah, but my like, what do you mean? My creds don't work. Like my creds expire. You can actually reset the password when you give me that's what I'm doing. Alright. Uh, okay. Uh, I'll uh, see how it goes. Or even just, I can just like directly plug in, I guess. Uh, you can, but that's the one that's streaming, so... Uh, you know what, it might be better if I just don't stream. Oh, you're not uh, Yeah, 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 that might be easier. Oh, no worries, man. Yeah, thanks for coming out. Yeah. Yeah, come to OWASP next week. In that case, I'm going to shut up the stream. Yeah.